Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. I hope you have had a nice time, a nice start this morning. And I welcome you all for the first part of this workshop where I will be talking about explainability in ML models. So let's get started. And um, so my name is Ankit Khare and I'm AI technologist at abacus.ai. We recently rebranded as uh, Lou just mentioned from reality engines to abacus.ai and we are operating under general avail availability now. So that's a little on the company. And today's agenda, let's quickly describe what we are gonna do in this workshop overall. So as I said, I'll take on the first part on explainable ML models, and then I'll hand it over to Matt, who will take on ML pipelines demo using our console and our UI interface. And then finally, Austin will take, uh, take you guys to uh, the same ML pipelines using our Python API client. And then at last, we will have a question answering session where you're all welcomed to pose any questions that you might have and we'll be glad to answer them. Sounds good? Oh, well, you can type yes, I might be able to look at it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so let's get started. So the title here is uh, something worth noticing, explainability in ML models. In the, in the industry, a lot of times AI and ML are used very interchangeably, but since I'm gonna cover a lot of research related to explainability, I'll keep in the terminologies that we generally refer to in academia. So I will use ML models here for this presentation. So before we even start with the methods that are involved with explainability, let's first, let's first observe why even we need explainability in ML systems. And why does it even make sense? So one of the reasons that we need it is for getting more people coming from different backgrounds involved. Like you all are coming from different backgrounds as you just mentioned in the chat box. And uh, you might have, there's a great diversity in this audience as far as uh, the familiarity with machine learning and even deep learning is con concerned. So for that purpose, like imagine if you have an ML model and you might have limited knowledge about the ML model itself. And then somehow you get another model that is giving you information about why the, the conclusion made by the first complicated ML model is like that. What is the reasoning, the line of reasoning, the line of thought behind that conclusion or the output that is given by that model? So how good it will be to understand the model itself, right? So it's, it's actually very helpful for the community to be able to uh, dig deeper into these black box complicated uh, models. Secondly, for someone like a machine learning engineer or ML practitioner in general, it is far, it becomes far easier to debug these ML models if you have some sort of explanation and if you're able to look into it by using all these uh, methods that I'm going to discuss with you guys. Third, a lot of times it's not just the need that, uh, that, that gets posed but also some sort of legal obligations that we, we face due to the wide use of ML in academia as well as industry. Like you can imagine a context where somebody wants to get a loan from a bank and then in that context, it becomes an obligation to have some sort of explanation, right? And then finally, we have better data labeling. So this is another interesting thing where the labelers might get some context from the explanations that these models gives about the ML model. The, the first original ML model. And then finally, they would be able to label the data better in, uh, by looking at the output of the original model and the output of the explanation model. So let's get started with our methods themselves. So I'll be discussing basically three major methods, SHAP, LINE, and then ANCHORS, which is kind of recent, uh, not that recent, 2018. But still, there's a lot of new research in that direction, so that's why I called it recent. So let me pose an interesting situation here as I describe some legal issues arise with bank context. So assume that you have somebody, John, who's trying to take a loan from some bank. And then the model says this, no loan, straight away. And then it also says very, in a very limited fashion that John will have a repayment capability uh, of like 45% or, or rather I would say like a 50% chance that he would pay he would fail to pay their installments on time. So then the, you might naturally ask why, even the manager should ask like, um, 
uh, why are we not able to give him loans? We should be aware about our, poly about our line of thought and reasoning on this situation, right? So you cannot just come in as a developer and say, hey, it's the AI magic, you know? So you definitely need some more explanation than this. So that's where explainability comes into play. So now I think I've motivated some sort of uh, context where explainability is very needed. You, you might imagine some other contexts as well. One of the major problems that come uh, in explainability is the trade-off between inter interpretability and the accuracy of the model. Like you might already be familiar with the variance bias trade-off, right? So similar trade-off comes into this field of explainability where if the complexity of the model increases, then, uh, then proportionately the accuracy decreases in general. So that's like a rule of thumb and vice versa. I mean, if the model is simple enough, then its accuracy is generally less. And in, in, in the real world, we, need, we, we see a lot of uh, complicated models that tend to perform well. So that's where we need um, sort of explanations on those models. So as I already just mentioned, linear models and other simple models like decision trees are quite straightforward and doesn't need explainability. But when it comes to some ensembling, boosting some gradient tree methods or uh, deep learning, deep neural networks, which is quite like a, which is not quite actually fully a black box without any argument. For these uh, kind of black boxes, it, these explainability methods become very handy. And the target of academia or research that is happening in this dimension is, is like, how would we have this arrow on the favorable side? That is like kind of getting this trade-off in the favor of explainability with a high performance as well, right? Like something like this. Okay, so with this, I'll move forward to these black boxes. So believe it or not, this is actually not even a dumbed down picture of what happens inside a deep neural network, you know? So um, I would rather argue that it's fairly complicated than this. And it's just like, it's, it's like a dumb representation of that. But anyways, the point here is, so what I'm trying to do here is trying to lay a ground on what, on how, like, on what are the basic principles that are involved uh, with the working of all these explainability methods, be it SHAP, be it LIME, or be it anchors, because they all, surprisingly perhaps, rely on the same principles, same underlying principles, one of which is, we don't, while making, an explanation, we are only concerned with one set of input values and output values. We ignore the rest. We are not concerned at that moment about that. So that is one major thing that you would like to keep and in, take into account when trying to decipher what these explainability models are based on. As I mentioned earlier, decision trees, which are fairly straightforward, don't need such kind of explanations, but for something like on the right-hand side, we definitely need some sort of explanation Feature attribution. Yep, that's one, another interesting principle that I would like to highlight here. So considering a black box classifier here, which has a corresponding feature input and an output, the task of the explainer is to, to give these features some sort of weights so that we can know that what feature was responsible for what output, right? So that is the overall idea behind training these explainability models. But don't worry, this is just a like very high level idea. We'll dig far deeper than this. So there's this guy. Um, um, uh, uh, he's the original researcher who came up with the idea of SHAP in 2017. And that was a big hit in NIPS 2017 that received the best paper award as well. And I like the way he approaches the, the ideas behind explainability. So I would follow the same convention. So. Uh, I think you might all be familiar with this leftmost uh, model, sorry, form. For every explanation that we might have, there's an associated form that we must declare firsthand, right? And then only we could have some sort of model getting trained on for generating explanations. So let's, let's first consider this left-hand side uh, form, which is quite easy to understand. You're given a set of weights, and then in this linear model, those uh, finding those weights would be quite straightforward, just averaging them and getting an input. We would know easily what's happening within. 
But for something as complicated as a deep neural network, it's not that straightforward. But we need to approach it. And for that, if you see the rightmost side, there are different fees, one to M for all those M features. So what we do is, is like, uh, instead of these weights, we kind of make these functions and we kind of fit these functions using an ML model in order to get to this final submission and averaging that we had in the leftmost case. And the form changes to this. So this is an interesting way to go about explainability. Okay. So without further ado, let me take, without, uh, uh, let me come back to the same scenario where this guy, John was trying to take a loan and illustrate some of these concepts using this scenario. So the leftmost thing, as you already saw here, uh, this produces a base rate, which is like on an average, we have a 20% probability of giving loans to some person. And then we have prediction for John from the model final output 55, as we saw earlier, black box. And now what you're trying to do is finding weights for all these, all those fee values, right? In the form on the right most right, right hand side that I just showed you. So all these fee values will have some definitive percentage associated with them. And that's what we're tr trying to find. So the way to go about it is, it, uh, about it is let's say we have uh, an age. And then let's say for now that somehow we come up with a number and that is 15%. That just means that if his age is 20, then the risk of him not getting a loan increases to 15%, right? Because young people, as you know, you know makes, uh, makes sense, I guess, right? And then day trading, it's a high risk job. So it on, uh, again, jumps it to 70% more, the risk factor. And then he has only one open account. So again, 15% addition becomes 90%. But then finally, he might have made a ton of money in recent stock market and then his capital gains, uh, capital gains leads to his uh, risk being reduced to 55%. And that's how the model came up with this explanation that, hey, uh, we cannot grant him the loan and the risk is 55%. He might not be able to pay installment. So let's now try to see how, how, how we can approach finding these numbers, all these percentage values that I just mentioned. So this is the base rate expected value of FX. And then these are the five values. And then what we will do is assume conditional independence and then try to find the expectations, keeping in mind that these are, all these features are conditionally independent of each other, right? So uh, a very general question uh, might come into your mind right now. Like why, why are we making these uh, assumptions of independence, right? So, so there's a very straightforward answer to this, that without having the final cumulative probability distribution of all these features, we cannot, uh, I mean, at least not accurately, we cannot calculate uh, all these separate features, no matter what kind of uh, fitting we do, linear or nonlinear models. So that's why we need the assumption of conditional independence where we assume that, okay, phi one with age 20 uh, has some, some weight W that we want to fit. And then phi two has some other weight that we want to fit independent of each other. And given phi one, we approach uh, conditionally on phi two. And then subsequently we approach on phi two, phi three and phi four, right? So in this way, following this principle of conditional independence, we would formulate a function and then fit the model. So now let me motivate a little on where this comes from. Like, uh, how do we, how did we manage to even get this far, right? Because that's, so, so the thing is, if you understand this uh, um, SHAP, the principles behind this quite well, then it will become quite intuitive, intuitive for you to understand line and then further anchors because they're very closely tied to each other and all the underlying principles are same as I already mentioned. Okay, so the game theory. So there was this guy Lloyd Chap in 2012, he received Nobel Prize for making a lot of properties about, um, about, uh, about stock market and some policies that are used um, to, to, uh, to address how to fairly distribute money for people who are playing these cooperative games, right? So for that, he, uh, did some tremendous work and that's how 
we got these properties, which very nicely channelized to our ML world. And, and I'll show you how. Uh, so this is one of the equations that is not that interesting, but you might have a look at it. That's why I kept it into the slide where I, I'm just saying like how people are features and the payoff is the model's real value predictions. But what is interesting is the property itself. So the first property is local accuracy, which is the additive property. So what happens here is, so notice this equation, expected value plus uh, the fee values for all the features, the submission of the fee values, and that gets equal to the final output of the model. So this is the first property itself, that if you have the final output of the model, then the submission of all the input features should be the subtraction of the output of the model minus the expected base rate that we had initially, right? I mean, you can easily break the property, but it makes sense to not break it and follow it in order to get these expected fee values. Second is monotonicity, consistency, where the idea is if you change the original model, if you tweak it a little, such that the feature, some particular feature, it always keeps on having this large impact no matter what the possible ordering is, then the input attribution should not decrease. Okay, so you might be thinking that uh, how the order matters. So remember, this model is a deep, maybe a deep neural network model that is used in most of the real world banking applications these days. And uh, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to find these attribution values, right? Fee values. And then uh, since the model itself is very nonlinear, if fee zero comes first and then fee two comes for first and then fee one comes first, the entire perspective of the model changes since it's very nonlinear, right? So, uh, so, so let's say that the, the guy was a great trader, trader and then we got to know that he was a young great trader. So there's an influence of the, of the guy being a great trader on the age factor. So there's an interaction behavior in there. And that's how this ordering matters because if we reverse this order, then everything changes. So a Dre trader who is young has a different interaction effect than the other way around when we know that there's a Dre trader and his age is 20. So the effect of age doesn't fall on day trading while in this case, Dre trading has an effect on age. So that's how these non-linearities work and the order matters a lot here. So people who are coming from the ML world, they might be wondering that, hey, I'm used to seeing these kind of Shapley values and graphs, so where are they? So I'm bringing it to your attention that uh, I'll come to that. And at the end of this talk, I will kind of use our platform. And uh, there's a project that I've created and I'll use those Shapley values to illustrate what's, what kind of explanations the model is generating. Okay, so I can just bring in this lime colored box and say that, hey, this is lime, the, new, the newer advancement that works better than Shap. Uh, but then again, you can always ask, hey, I'm very satisfied with my uh, Shapley values and they make perfect sense to me. Then why would I even need that? So then I would have to pose a question in front of you that think of the ordering that I just mentioned about here. So there's a definitive order that matters. And then for every fee value, we have a position, right? Like it might come in the second position, third position, fourth position. So there are like total n factorial combinations for each features that we have. And it becomes computationally really very inefficient to calculate all this. So what can we do? It becomes an NP hard problem. Well, in most of the ML problems, what we do? What do we do? We, we kind of try to approximate the result, right? So here comes the line, which is very good at approximating it in a very computationally efficient manner. So I already uh, elaborated what was missing in chat, right? And now I will address how line fits in and, uh, and eliminates all those missing elements and pieces that were there in chat. So if you see this cost, uh, this uh, equation for some linear model that is being fit in order to predict values for explanations, then you would notice that there are three hyperparameters, log, loss function, regularizer, and local kernel that needs to be estimated to in order to feed this 
linear regression model for generating explanations towards some complicated model. So now this equation itself is not as important as these hyperparameter values that we need to find loss function, local kernel, and regularizer. So there's a, a like a complicated formula for, uh, for um, estimating the local kernel. Uh, so you, you might want to look into the original line paper in order to really understand how this kernel function is evaluated and estimated. But yeah, I just wanted to show you this, that these three functions under the assumption of the required precision, precision and the, and the, and the constraint factors that we have on getting the final exp uh, output value, we would have some definitive answer and definitive values for the log function, the local kernel, and the regularization. And the linear regressor would be able to fit in all these values to be able to produce uh, the final explanations that we desire for such a complex deep neural network or some other kind of uh, complicated black box model. So now let's say that we have one such linear regressor, regressor that gives us all these predictions, then how would we utilize it to, to produce our, um, our uh, predictions, like explain, explain, explainability predictions, that what features are important for what point, data points. So let's say we have this red plus mark, the bold one, then what essentially happens is we sample some points and the nearby, and the way the line works is it, it represents a local context in such a way that all these nearby points, it gives them the maximum value. And as the distance increases based on some distance fun function that you might use, Euclidean or whatever, it would keep on decreasing the weights of the features. And that's how it tries uh, to fit a linear model to generate those explanations, right? So let's move on. Uh, further. So there's this, before we come to this diagram and understand a bit more about line, uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to this concept, interpre interpretable features. Uh, it's nothing uh, fancy, but when you want to use some unstructured data modality like that of text or image, then you might want to introduce a binary fact, uh, vector that represents whether those words were pr present or absent. Or in case of images, there might be some contiguous regions of interest that you might have and you might want to look into whether they're absent or present. And then these features, these binary feature vectors, you can utilize for getting those line explanations. So that's what is happening here. These are those binary vectors representing these data points. And then, uh, so this region, this blob of any classifier, this actually is the original complicated classifier for which you are trying to generate the explanations. And this line, this is the new regression explain explainability model that you're trying to fit. And it gives these kind of weights to all these features uh, using that loss function, uh, I mean, that equation that I described earlier. Remember the regularizing thing and the loss function? And then it produces all these weight values, minus 2.1, 1.1, 0. Point. So the, the higher the value, the darker the color, and the more the impact of the feature. And uh, the values that positively influence will be in blue in color, uh, are shown as blue in color. And then for some neural network that might have sparse uh, weights inside, then you might increase the regularization impact that was there in that equation, this one, and that will enhance, uh, that will facilitate you to use the sparsity feature for that model. So let's go to some examples here that might be good for you to be able to understand um, and make more sense of what are the advantages of using Lime and uh, we already discussed the advantages, but it will just illustrate them and elaborate them. So let's say there's some sort of situation where you have a husky and a wolf, and that's get and that gets quite confusing due to the the way they look, right? So, so this is the second row. It denotes the the explanation, the explainability output from the second model, the the regression or whatever model you're using. So as you can clearly see, it says that it doesn't actually look at the wolf or the husky. It actually looks at the snow surroundings in order to get to the result that it has. So that's, that's actually not at all plausible, right? That, like, and, and you guys already might know that neural networks are like very good at finding the shortest way out. So that's what they do, just fit in, reduce the loss function and find the, uh, the shortest way out, right? So, so here comes explainability. So this is like very advantageous. It becomes quite easy now 
to see like how we can modify our model on the basis of the explanations that are produced by these explainability models. Same as the case with text. In the interest of time, I would not go into the text. It's quite easy to understand. You can just have a look and understand, make sense of it. So as I already mentioned, Lime leads to trust, insight, and then finally you can improve on the basis of the insight. Now let's start with anchors, our final topic. Uh, so this is a fairly recent development uh, and uh, it's model agnostic explanations. The paper was written by uh, these three guys and it's, it's actually quite a fascinating paper. You might wanna have a look if you're interested in, these, in this field. Okay, one thing I missed, I should come back to this. Look at this. Uh, should we act on the explanations generated by model and why? So this question is very important because this entire paper kind of addresses the answer to this question that shall we really act on the explanations generated? And if yes, then why? So these, so let's say you have a model that gives explanations and there's a human and he has to do further feature engineering or some sort of model tweaking or some sort of labeling task. And then he has all these explanations handy. And then uh, this paper, what they do is they kind of describe two important metrics in order to evaluate how this can be efficiently done, utilizing the efficiency to do further engineering, right? M maybe feature engineering or model engineering or whatever. So the first thing that comes is if the person thinks, uh, if the person really thinks that he or she knows what the model is going to do. And the second question arises whether, uh, and the second situation is like, they might really not have any idea, right? So based on these two clauses, these two plausible situations, they define two metrics, coverage and precision. So coverage is less important. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if you were in front of me, I would have asked you why, but now I'll just tell you the answer. So you might already kind of think naturally that if the person thinks that he knows, then he might be wrong, right? Because he thinks he knows. He might be utterly wrong. So this metric kind of becomes tricky and not so useful in a lot of cases and contexts. But in case of precision, this is very useful because it's a conditional probability based on whether the person is right if he assumes that he's, he knows what the model is going to predict. So let's illustrate it further using the sentiment analysis example. So, so there's a case where uh, that the output is this positive uh, and the, uh, the clause was this movie is not bad and the other is like negative notion where the clause was the movie is not very good. So I, I briefly mentioned in case of flying, what it does is it, it has a local preference. It does not see all the features in the entire domain for every data point globally. So that becomes kind of confusing for the labor, labeler, sorry, or for the end user to, to, like, to make sense out of these explanations, seeing it globally. Like if you see it all together, like what is more important, this bad or not on left-hand side? And on the right-hand side, what is more important? Not or good? Like the together makes sense if you anchor it and say not bad, not good. But individually in a holistic context, it might actually confuse the person, right? You might have a lot of such clauses as shown below the audio is not bad. And you might have the same problem arising when you sample all these data points and try to sample their explanations and try to come up with, uh, with further tweaking of the model or labeling or whatever you're trying to do with the explanations, right? So this is the idea behind anchor, that given some anchor, how, how does it impact the precision of the outputs that are being generated by your explainability model, right? So what happens is, uh, uh, our hypo hypothesis here is, we need an outcome which is conditioned on, uh, on the anchor, the given anchor. In this case, it's, a di it's this. And then we need it to be greater than 95% in order to select that anchor, right? So we, so that's, that's actually the approach behind anchors. That's the whole idea behind this paper. But let's go a little more deeper and try to understand how they do it. Like how would they come up to this 95% or more precision and would get their desired anchors, right? So they would start with something entirely random. Like this movie is not bad. And for each word they will, uh, that, that they sample, they will have 
this conditional probability conditioned on the selected word, this movie is not bad, whatever. And then it starts with 50%, which is just random guessing. And then we will start uh, conditioning it uh, on the explanations and seeing whether it makes sense or not. So that's how the precision starts. Uh, the more the data points you sample, the more the pre precision fluctuates. So you might also wonder why is there a mean and a standard deviation, right? So the answer I already kind of gave, if you have a lot of data points, then the more the number of samples that you produce, the more there might be some possible deviations among them. So that's how we kind of measure them in, on the basis of a distribution which has a mean and uh, some sort of standard deviation to it. Okay, now what we do is we uh, keep on making these words an anchor and keep sampling and keep looking at the, uh, the outputs and see whether we get the precision of more than 95% or not. And as you can see, only in one case, not you're kind of succeeding, but the mean is still low. So what, you can, what can you do? There are three methods. Either you change the model, second, either you sample more data points, right? Or I think that's it, yeah. So, uh, or, or maybe you change the anchor itself. You, you keep on like using your vocabulary to change the anchor itself. So these three ways, I think. Nothing more than that you can do, right? So uh, if you keep on doing that, then this kind of keeps fluctuating where you get to near and near to the right anchors, which is not, right? The movie's not bad. So as you can see, not is the most uh, important thing there. So it gives the most precision. And eventually, if you anchor, okay, so if you see below, you have done some, some cool stuff here. So that is, that is very clever. On, on um, like, I would I would really appreciate these uh, authors or uh, of those papers, of that paper, like what they did, what what they came up with, uh, the the idea that they came up with was something, I would say like cl is close to uh, agglom agglomer hierarchical agglomerative clustering, so it's like you anchor, you kind of make these tuples, you add not with every other uh, word that you encounter, and then you sample those all, all those data points and calculate the precision so automatically because of the not in that you will have more than 80 percent uh precision and then whatever comes after not will will just add on to the precision so if you keep doing that for all these sampling all, all these uh, data <clears throat> data points then you will eventually come up with something that is more than 95 percent in this case it is not bad so that is what we desire right this anchor not bad so i would I would also hint towards like the method that they use. It's like a, like a, a reinforcement learning based method uh, that they, they use for like uh, sampling all these things and kind of coming up to this uh, anchor. So that's also automated. It's not like manually done. You don't have to write code for that. And if you really want to dig deeper into how this is done, you might really want to look at the paper. So now, um, I will, before jumping to, um, I think I'm almost way over the time. So before jumping to the, um, the, uh, our UI and the project that I already mentioned about, I would finally conclude this slide with the significance of having good explanations. So an interesting insight from that paper, the same paper, the anchor one, is this. On the leftmost side, if you see, uh, the predictions. So there were some, uh, uh, like you might know about uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, right? So these, these Mechanical Turk people, what they do is like they try to utilize these explanations for labeling the data and they might be given the original output from the original complicated model and this explainability model and its inferences. And then they would be required to give their explanations. So when they use no explanation, then it was just random guessing 50-50. With line, it raised, it got raised to 67.57%. And then with anchor, it got surprisingly, I guess, it, it got reduced to 31.8%. And then how often they, they were correct, you can see in the middle graph. And then how often, and what was the time they took for the prediction that also you can see in anchor's case, it's the least. So you might wonder why, like why there was this reduction on the leftmost side of, so like, it's, it's, it's quite intuitive if you see it from that angle. You know, if you are sure that this is, that you know that this is, this is gonna be the outcome of the model, 
then you would be like, ah, just leave it. I know what it's going to be like. So you won't bother to even make a prediction, right? So your coverage actually becomes nicer, that metric coverage that I introduced earlier, along with the precision one. So that becomes like a, a little more relevant here in case of Anchor, where you have high coverage and you know that people know the right answer. And they are actually right when they think that they know the right answer. Oh yeah, so finally, uh, before moving on and handing over to Matt, I would just quickly go over to the, um, the SHAP explanations that we make in our AI service at uh, abacus.ai. As I said, you might be familiar, people who are ML engineers or who come from data science background will, uh, and who utilize explainability to any extent, they would be familiar with this Shapley graph. So let's quickly go towards our interface and uh, illustrate how the SHAP works on one of the data sets that we have trained a model upon. Let me quickly share the screen. Uh, uh, where is the, sorry, it's taking a bit here. Um, sorry, let me have, I'm having a little trouble with the interface. Just let me quickly check the interface. Okay, there, I got it. Okay. I guess Austin is sharing the interface with you guys. Can you all see the interface? Uh, I'm not currently sharing anything. Um, we can switch over to Matt uh, and we can circle back around. Okay, yeah, yeah, let me figure that out by that time. All right, well, cool. let me yeah. get things set up. All right, folks, uh, let's see. And let's make sure we got all the chat windows open. All right, um, so thank you very much, uh, Ankit, for that little that dive into explainability. Um, so uh, again, my name's Matt, um, senior engineer uh, here at uh, Abacus, and we'll be, I'll be walking you guys through, or you folks through uh, the pipelines and uh, workflows feature in the product. Uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen. I've got a um, collab workbook open. Uh, let's see here. All right, cool. Austin's already ch posted it in chat. All right, awesome. So um, let's see here. Uh, okay, cool. So um, so let me, I'll, I'll be going over the, so there's, I'll be going over uh, again, like motivation of what this, this pipelines and workflow system is. Um, and then uh, and more specifically, I'll be going over the, the UI aspects also. And then afterwards, I'll be handing off to Austin to actually go through the SDK portion of this. Uh, on that collab notebook, there'll be in that, uh, there's a prerequisite session. Um, let me actually quickly change the size of my cursor so you guys can see in case it actually does show up. I don't remember if, uh, what's it called? Zoom, we'll pick this up. Uh, let's see here. Okay, because I'm going to be doing a lot of clicking around the UI. Hopefully, you guys can see my cursor. Um, 
So again, we have the sign up link. Go ahead and use that if you haven't already. If you uh, signed up originally with us uh, under our uh, previous uh, name, Reality Engines AI, your account should still work. You'll be, you'll be redirected to abacus.ai and uh, you'll be able to click around and do and, and, and follow along. Um, so while, while people are getting set up, uh, I want to kind of motivate what is this feature? What is, what, is, what is this new thing that we've added to Abacus, this pipelines or workflow thing? Uh, why is it useful? Where can it be used? Um, and just also then like see, demonstrate how we've chosen to implement this in our product. Uh, so the, uh, the idea here is that you know, your, your, your machine learning models, whatever you build is going to constantly be evolving or even the data sets that you're using will be evolving. Uh, so either like you're using some time series information and, uh, you know, time is always moving forward. So you've got more data as things actually happen. So you have new actuals that you've been using that you want to drive through whatever model you have or you want to retrain that model with this new information, hopefully improving the accuracy and the performance of the given model. So these, 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 these flows where you will need to now take in this data, do this ingestion, all this stuff, uh, we've already abstracted most of this point and click wise, but you can still make things a little faster, right? It's a very common use case to be able to be receiving new data sets. Uh, if it's a recommendations thing, maybe you've got more information uh, regarding a user that can be then fed into that recommendations uh, uh, model. So uh, again, the whole point of this is to make things easier for A, integrating to whatever uh, new tooling you may have or for your personal projects so that you can run these predictions in a much uh, more efficient way. So again, um, hopefully people have been able to set up their accounts. Uh, let me know in chat if that's uh, a problem. But um, so what I'm showing right now, we've got, uh, again, my section is gonna be mostly in clicking around the UI. Um, and for this, we are using uh, the uh, Walmart's data set. So this is from Kaggle. Uh, I think we have a link to it uh, up here. Yeah, we do right here. Um, what I've done is I've split that up to kind of simulate what I was kind of describing earlier in terms of time series data sets, right? So the Walmart data set, it's a weekly data set uh, from uh, roughly February 2010 to October uh, 2012. And this is their sales data where, where it's uh, segmented by sales and department. And uh, what I've done is I've kind of split up that data. I kind of lopped off the last few months of data in that time series uh, data set so that we have one that goes from that beginning date, uh, February 2010 to April 13th. And then what happened, and then I kept the original one, which is all the way through to October 26th. So both of these documents, uh, uh, make sure you have them downloaded if you're gonna be following through. We'll be uploading these manually through the product and kind of showing how we can trigger uh, these, these pipelines. In addition to this, there's the Walmart metadata. Uh, this is just store data, uh, doesn't really, need to be pruned. So I left it as is. It's possible new stores may have opened during that time, but it shouldn't make too much of a difference for the purposes of this uh, walkthrough. All right. So uh, in the collab, I also have this little, little overview. This is in case you get a little bit lost or fall behind for whatever reason or want to revisit this uh, in a later date. Um, but Let's see here. The, I mean, the basic idea is that we're gonna be creating a brand new project. Uh, I mentioned demand forecasting, we'll actually be using sales and revenue forecasting. Um, and then we'll be uploading the, the data set, uh, the truncated one first, and then running it through the product. Uh, and then I'll do a little bit of the standard um, cooking show magic to uh, bring up another project that I've already trained or prepped. And then we'll go through and just see how this all works through. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this. All right, and so here, uh, this is when you log in. Odds are if you've worked with, if you've participated in our workshops before, you'll probably have a couple other projects. And here I've got my pre-baked one as well as some of the stuff that uh, Ankit was planning on showing off. But for the purposes of this part of the, the uh, 
workshop, we'll first create a new project. Uh, like I mentioned, in, so in the documentation, I incorrectly wrote demand forecasting. We'll instead be using sales and revenue forecasting. And then we're gonna do project Walmart. All right. And so now we're gonna create brand new data sets. So here uh, again, so here we've got also a little bit of a breakdown of what we expect in the schema or the different types of columns that we expect in that, in that particular data set. Uh, so in, we're gonna create a new one. This is going to be the, uh, because this is the historical sales data. So it's gonna be the Walmart, Walmart uh, sales data. Okay. And we're gonna, upload, uh, you're not gonna see what exactly, but uh, note the file name. We wanna make sure we're uploading the April 13th, 2012 uh, .csv. Again, this is the one that I have linked here um, in the collab uh, workbook. All right, so we're gonna, I'm just gonna quickly show off this uh, for those that maybe have not put messed around with our UI. We do have some built-in stuff that will actually analyze whatever you're planning on upload uh, locally on your computer. Um, it does its best to be somewhat fairly performant. You can go up to 1 million rows. I've tried that before with this particular one. It can be a little slow, uh, but I mean, it's a million rows. So uh, just looking at this, you can get an idea of like, okay, am I actually uploading the correct one? Looking at the various columns, this does look like it is a uh, sales or time series data set. So cool, we're gonna go ahead and add that. All right. And then let's go ahead and also do the item attributes. So this will be our Walmart store data. Uh, for whoever's asking that question about the collab notebook, it's the bit.ly link. The bit.ly link will take you directly to our collab notebook. All right, so, and now I'm gonna upload, I think I have it named slightly differently locally, but this will be Walmart uh, underscore metadata.csv. Uh, for me, it's Walmart stores. I forgot to rename it locally. And again, we can preview this and we see here that it's, it's a fairly lightweight uh, data set matches with what we'd expect from a metadata uh, data set. It's just got a bunch of stores, no necessary date stamps or anything like that. All right, cool. So now we can go ahead and go to explore and train. So what's happening here is we're doing a little bit of sanity checking. Uh, we can see that the data is still processing. Um, and once this is finished, which should be in a few seconds, we will then be able to uh, confirm the schema mapping. This is just a sanity check to make sure that what we've figured out as the schema matches with what you're kind of expecting it to be. Uh, let's see here. Do we have a classic demo or walkthrough problem here? All right, so um, I'm gonna quickly hop over to uh, the, pro the project that I've already pre-prepared. So ideally what would happen is that uh, we would actually, it would be both of these data sets would actually, they would go to an active state and then you would be asked to go through the schema explorer uh, there will be a wizard that will uh, walk you through saying, hey, these are the various, you know, this is the required columns and it'll ask one by one, the item ID, sales, the date, and it'll include some helpful uh, commentary on like, what, what are we expecting? So the item idea being, the ID being, uh, what is the, well, it's a unique identifier. Is this a store? Is this a, uh, a, a particular item? Uh, some, some, identifier that's, that will also be joining if you provide the metadata. Sales in this case, of course, being whatever you're trying to uh, forecast. So 
uh, this particular case, we're talking about the weekly sales and the date, of course, because we're looking at a time series. Um, let me see if we can go back and it's, all right, cool. I can actually do it. All right, so this is what I was just describing. Uh, we have I'm ID. We do um, try to filter down. Uh, so what happens, we, we looking at the, uh, the type of the column, we will limit, try to limit the number of potential options here. So for example, weekly sales, oh, something seems a little odd, here we go. And then date is date. All right, so uh, we now have a uh, full schema for these, this particular data set. Uh, later on, I mean, oh, something isn't happy, cool. All right, so next step, we're gonna to go to the training. So uh, like I said before, the data set, the time series data set itself is uh, weekly. So uh, in terms of what the prediction length is, this is the number of time steps forward that it's gonna be predicting. So uh, in our case, it's gonna be predicting about a month or four weeks. Uh, we have our quantiles. Uh, we, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ping on the chat. Uh, forecast frequency, if you need to, you can override. But in general, for this particular demo, uh, we can, or this particular project, sorry, and data set, we can just go with the defaults. All right, so now comes the waiting game. Uh, we have now trained a model. We can see here, or we're, sorry, we have now started the training of a model. And so we can see here that it's in the process. We have one particular model version. And we can see here, we also got the prediction length and all that. Uh, I'm gonna now jump back over to the prepared project that I have. Okay, so um, let's say you've trained it, then you can, then what you'll need to do is you'll actually need to deploy it. Um, I've already deployed mine, but if we change that, uh, let's, we can do this, I guess. Um, so when you, you'll be given the option to actually create a new deployment here. And then um, from that, oh, I should have done that. Oh, well. Anyways, so from there, you should be able to click on the create new batch prediction. And from there, we'd be able to kick one of these off. Um, so here I've got two. Uh, so, but the, the key thing is in the beginning, right, we'll have already only uploaded a data set up to April 13th. So uh, when, we, when you kick off the batch prediction, it'll be using whatever the data that you've already selected uh, for that data set. So at the time it was only the, the April 13th data set. So then, um, we go back, I need to, well, this is not refreshing yet. Hmm, okay. Um, so now I wanna get back, get to, so now so far we've talked about just creating a project, which is no different from any of the others, any other way of using our UI in, in, in Abacus.ai. So the part I wanna really show off here is the uh, workflows or the pipelines that we currently have. And this is what I was saying before kind of allows you to um, quickly, uh, oh, there's a question about multiple hours. Uh, in particular, I mean, it, it depends on the model and the, the project, the data set, all that. In this particular case, this should probably take somewhere around, uh, I believe it's around 45 minutes. We can check right here. So yeah, about 40 minutes or so, 30, 40 minutes uh, is, is what it'll take. We're going to be, I'm Again, I'm just going to be moving ahead, showing off some uh, the features, and you're free to try this out yourself uh, using that invite link. All right, so going back to uh, what I was saying about like making things easier. So let's say we now want to actually try it against that full data set, which is only up through October. So we can go here. We're looking at the sales data. There's an upload new version here. So let, we can do that. Uh, we can select the full version. Um, oh, mine's called full sorted. Oh, it's fine. And we have these uh, extra radio buttons. So um, this is kind of where that whole pipeline thing comes into play. We have one option, right? So we have this right here, the retrain. 
uh, the model and generate new predictions. Uh, this does pretty much exactly what it says. There's a little bit more that it does, but what it basically will do is, again, like it says, retrain the model. It will also uh, spin up or it will also update your, your whatever deployment, active deployment you have to be using this newly trained model. And then it will actually perform the prediction. So this, this predictions that we're talking about is what I was looking, what I was showing earlier, this batch prediction page. Uh, the, the best way to think of that is like if you just simply want to run the inference across a larger data set and just one shot, boom, you have all of your stuff. And now you can do a bunch of processing uh, post facto. Uh, and this is useful, of course, if you have uh, a bunch of if you're actually using the uh, inference API to in whatever projects or or uh, stuff that you're you're using you have, uh, and allows you to kind of keep things moving along, right? You're always using the, the the latest stuff. The other option that we currently have, and I'm going to do it uh, with this right now, is to generate new predictions without retraining. So this kind of skips a step. This skips the model training as well as the deployment. And what it basically does is it, it just allows you to upload this new data set, use the existing model that's been trained and is uh, selected by whatever, de active, whatever deployment you may have and will run this data against that last trained model. So again, this is the, yep, this is the full data set. And so now I've uploaded that. Uh, it's doing the data processing. We see here it's now processing that. And even though my deployment, for some reason, is in a stuck state, we can see here that we've already at least put in a, a, a shim saying that, hey, we're going to actually um, we put in a shim that will actually be uh, doing a batch prediction. Uh, let's see, there's a question. Collab about everything that we've done in the UI and code. Not quite. Uh, Austin will be covering a little bit extra, uh, but the uh, phrasing of the section over here with the uh, overview should kind of walk you through most of the steps that I've just performed. Um, and in fact, that's a nice little segue to go back to this collab. Um, let's see. That's going to continue predicting. That's fine. So uh, why is this useful? So I just want to include here a little bit of the snippets of the uh, batch prediction output based off of the two uh, different input data sets. So we have, right, when we had trimmed that time series data down to April 13th, uh, like I mentioned before, we're doing model predictions. We set it up for a prediction length of four, which means we'll be predicting the next four uh, time periods, AKA four weeks in this case. So here we can see that for this particular depart store department uh, pair, 10-1, we're actually continuing from April 13th and making these extra predictions. Uh, we can see here, there's the quantiles. That's something we can talk that can be asked about off offline. But the main thing I wanted to demonstrate here is that now when I updated it with a different, uh, with the updated uh, time series information, which goes all the way up to October 26th, we can see that the batch predictions are now performing past that. So now we're including, we're, we've included all that uh, information that we figured we've collected the actuals between uh, April and, and, and October, and now we're predicting forward from October all the way through uh, the end of November. All right. So that hopefully wasn't too fast of a quick of a walkthrough on the, uh, the, the, the UI component of like how we can do these predictions. Again, so I've shown off only one. Um, technically, you can do this with this retrain with model. Uh, and what it'll do, actually, I can quickly do this right now. Uh, it's fine that I'm using the same data set. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it might not be happy. Let's see if I can actually kick off the deployment or not. Okay, maybe not, that's fine. So I'm gonna add the full data set again. This time I'm selecting retrain model and generate new predictions. And so what we'll see here is that not only have we, re we're now reprocessing that data set, we will have a new pipe model version uh, being prepared. 
and then also planned is that batch prediction. So with a couple of clicks, you're able to kind of kick off this entire flow and uh, it just makes that a little bit easier uh, for uh, use cases that don't need SDK interact, um, integration. Cool. Um, and are there any Any questions? Nope. All right, cool. Then I guess I'll hand it off to Austin, unless Ankit, were you able to get things ready? Uh, Ankit will circle back around after, uh, after I get through mine. Okay, sounds good. Excellent. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. Uh, we're going to hop back over to the workbook uh, and we're going to spend the rest of this workshop inside of the workbook. Um, essentially what we're going to show off is how we can fully automate using Abacus AI uh, from a Python uh, program. And so we're going to use the, the collab here. Um, we start from the second section or ma major header here. So let's go ahead and just collapse the leveraging pipelines in the UI. And we'll start uh, from the constructing a pipeline in the SDK. If you've lost uh, the, the workbook, uh, we'll be posting a link uh, back in the chat again. Uh, it's going to be the bit.ly.com slash capital A abacus, uh, capital AI. And that'll bring you to back to the, the workbook. Um, and if you've already created your account and been following along, uh, the, the first thing that we need to do is actually go ahead and go back to the UI just to grab an API key uh, as we need to authenticate uh, with the, the SDK. Um, but if you haven't yet uh, created your account, make sure to click on the sign up link. Uh, we are in GA, but we do have a uh, invite system for these uh, free trials. And so this will set you up with a, an account that allows you to train uh, completely for free uh, for this workshop. So go ahead and uh, click on the sign up link, create your account. You can use uh, sign up with Google or GitHub um, or use the emails and password. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, click on the API key dashboard. And so this will open up Abacus and new tab. Uh, it's going to bring you to this API key dashboard, uh, assuming that, of course, you have signed in already. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, switch over let's see, to a new tab. Actually, I think I might be able to. I don't remember my password for this uh, as I've been using the login with Google. And let me go ahead and switch my tab over uh, to show off the API key dashboard here. Uh, so just one moment. Opening up the screen sharing settings again. All right, so let's go over to the API, API key dashboard. So if you clicked on the link uh, you, and you are logged into your account, uh, you should be brought to this dashboard. This will show you a list of all your API keys. If you haven't created one, it'll be empty. Um, so what we can do here is just go ahead and create a, a new API key and give it a tag. I'm going to call this my uh, workshop demo API key. I'm going to hit create. Now this will give me a brand new API key, uh, which will allow me to authenticate my API client with the uh, with Abacus AI. So I'm just going to hit copy, and I'll automatically copy the API key to my clipboard, and then we'll go ahead and hop back over to the workbook and get started. So I'll switch my screen again. Back to the workbook. All right. So now if we navigate down a little bit, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is hit play on this uh, pip install Abacus AI. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with uh, Google Colabs, essentially it is a, uh, 
cloud computer uh, that's automatically provisioned for you to allow you to run Python code. It allows us to collaborate without you having to download anything on your computer, set up your environment, whatever. Um, so this will just walk us through how to set up a project uh, using Abacus AI, and then we'll go through setting up a, a pipeline uh, ML training for forecasting. So let's go ahead and hit play. It's going to ask if you uh, want to run this program. Uh, so we'll hit run. And that will uh, automatically start provisioning uh, a computer to us. And then it will start installing the Abacus AI Python client. Um, the next step, uh, once that is done, we'll scroll down and hit play on the next box. And that's just going to import some standard libraries from, from Python, uh, which will help us preview the CSV files, as well as uh, just uh, pretty prints the output. And now for the API key, uh, make sure you still have it in your clipboard. If you don't, uh, we have a little handy link here. Uh, so you can click on that and grab your key. Now we're going to hit paste on this form uh, for your API key. Uh, so right here in this section, uh, make sure you hit paste before you hit play. If you hit play first, that'll assign an empty string to your variable. Uh, so if you need to run it again after you paste, just hit run. Uh, so there's no penalty for rerunning sections here. Um, and so now that we have your API key uh, and we've downloaded and installed the uh, Abacus client, what we're going to then do is import the Abacus client and instantiate it with your API key. And so once you hit play here, uh, if this runs with no issue, then you've provided a valid API key. And so we can go ahead and continue. Uh, so now, now that we've uh, have the instantiated client, we're going to basically walk through uh, similar steps as we had shown with the, uh, the UI, uh, but we're going to just show you how you can easily do it using the API. Um, so uh, in the initial UI, you saw a big screen with uh, lots of different use cases. Uh, you can see those same use cases along with some of the descriptions uh, by calling the list use cases API. And so it gives a, give you a whole bunch of enums that you can use. Uh, and so we'll be using that in just a moment. Uh, but then you can also see the pretty name as well as the descriptions for each. Um, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and select sales forecasting from this uh, as we're trying to predict uh, sales and re or, uh, sales forecasting for each of our departments inside of Walmart. Um, and so we're going to then set the use case variable to sales forecasting. Uh, so we'll hit play on this next box. And uh, just to be able to preview like what the requirements are for this use case, we can call the uh, API client describe use case requirements. Uh, again, this is all mimicked uh, similar in the, the UI um, as the UI is powered by these APIs. Uh, so we just have uh, the, uh, we get essentially the a list of uh, valid data sets you can upload as well as the columns that are required for each of these data sets. Um, as well as the enums that we'll be passing in for these data sets. So when we update or upload our sales history data set, we'll give it a data set type of sales history. And uh, we also have a secondary, uh, which is the item attributes. And so this is just the metadata for each of our uh, store departments. Uh, okay, so now that we know the requirements and we've got our use case, uh, we can go ahead and create our project. Uh, so by calling this next box, I will call the create project uh, API. And uh, it will then automatically create the project with the use case that we've passed in. And we'll we'll just uh, print out the, the response here. So we just get a, the base I created at a project ID, which we'll be using uh, to, to make further calls. Uh, and then also confirm that it is uh, set to sales forecasting. Um, and so just at why we're using these use cases uh, for each of these, uh, for our project containers inside of uh, Abacus AI, we're, we're essentially uh, using some hyperparameters and tuning, uh, specifying different requirements for each of our use cases that helps us better uh, predict and, and use the best uh, deep learning algorithms to give you the highest performing model possible. And so uh, by specifically uh, selecting your use case or business use case and aligning it with uh, reality engines, we're able to then uh, produce a much, much better model than we would if it was just say in a generic table that we were trying to predict from. Um, so 
now we're going to go ahead and add the data sets to our project. Uh, so in the UI, Matt walked you through uploading these data sets uh, directly in the UI. Um, but we provide actually a lot more functionality, um, both in the UI and as well as the API, which allows you to automate uh, the ingestation, uh, ingestion of the, uh, the data sets. Um, and so what we're going to do here is actually uh, import these directly from S3. And this allows us to set up a, a pipeline for ingesting these data sets automatically. Uh, and so that way you can actually set up an entire pipeline that goes from uh, importing the data uh, and, uh, and training a model and, and getting out batch predictions all on a schedule. And so you never have to go back into the UI and upload a new version of your data set. It's, it's handled automatically um, using our pipelines. So uh, just to give a preview, uh, you have seen these data sets already, so I won't spend too much time in here, but we can use pandas to read these directly from S3. And so you'll see that we've got uh, about 3,300 uh, store departments um, with some metadata about the store, like how large it is. Uh, we've got the, and then the, the sales. So this is going to be our million plus row. Um, actually, it looks like. I'm sorry, 421,000 row. Um, so this is going to be for each department, we're gonna have a timestamp with the weekly sales, as well as a bunch of other metadata about that, that specific time. So what was the temperature like? Uh, was it a holiday? Um, what is the unemployment in the area? And so that, that gives us a lot more information to use at every single timestamp uh, for each department to help uh, predict what our sales are gonna be. Um, so, this is going to uh, diverge a little bit from, again, the UI, where we're actually going to start setting a refresh schedule. And so as I mentioned, we're going to tell Abacus uh, every, every day at uh, 12 PM UTC, I want you to uh, go to this location in S3 and pick up the latest data. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, create this data set, uh, Walmart sales. We're going to give it a publicly available S3 bucket um, so we have a, a sales forecasting walmart.csv. Uh, we're going to give it our project ID. Uh, so this is the project that we created uh, for, for the sales forecasting. And then we're going to tell Abacus what the data set type is. So this is, this is our sales history data set. And again, the refresh schedule, this is in a cron syntax. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, I provided a link to crontab.guru uh, that uh, is a, a useful little ta or useful site for just uh, converting this into plain text and also experimenting. If say you wanted to change this uh, on a monthly schedule, you could uh, insert them. Or I'm sorry, on a yearly schedule, you could set it for a specific month, setting it to a star says every month, um, every day of the month, uh, at a specific hour. And so I'm saying at 12 UTC, we're going to import our data set. So uh, without further ado, I'll just hit play on this. And so this is going to create those data sets. And so it's already done. So we've our Abacus is now going and fetching this data and then also has now scheduled uh, for every day at noon UTC, we're going to import this data again. Um, and so while, uh, as you saw in the UI, we had like a, a spinning icon for while we're processing the data set. So uh, the API provides a, uh, utility as well that allows you to wait for uh, Abacus to finish processing these data sets. So this will just sit and for each of these data sets, wait for it to get done detecting the schema. Um, so now that everything is, is up and quick or working quickly again, so we've got uh, the schema is already detected. Um, so we'll, for each of these data sets, we have the sales schema. Um, so this is, has the, the dates, uh, everything again, you saw in the UI with uh, the schema and you can see that it's automatically detected all of the columns that are important. So we have our date column uh, automatically uh, mapped to a internally as a date. Um, our weekly sales, this is the, our column mapping sales, what we're trying to predict. Um, and then uh, we also have the store department, which has automatically been uh, identified as the item ID. And so that's just the identifier that joins the, the uh, store attributes with the sales schema. So you can, uh, uh, so that way we're uh, applying or automatically joining all of the metadata at each time step um, for each, every, each and every store department. Uh, so yeah, now that we have uploaded our data sets and we're, we're all sets uh, scheduled to refresh every single day, 
what we're going to do is hit validate on the project. Um, so this is just checking uh, are all the required data sets met in our project? Um, have we set the schema? Uh, we have all the required columns. This will just give us a, a quick validation. Uh, it will tell us if we're missing anything inside of the data set errors. And it also provides us with column hints. So if we had a if we had not yet uh, set the schema or there is more options for what might might have been a ID, if, if for example, there we had multiple uh, store identifiers, we could then, uh, it would tell us, you know, like here, here are the overlapping columns and I can automatically join on, on either of these columns. Um, and then also like here, like multiple columns I identified as a date. And so you can then use this to, to help a prompt uh, or, or to automatically select the, the right one um, if you had multiple options. So now that we have our project, it's valid. Uh, that means it's ready to train. Uh, so just like in the UI, we're going to hit play on this. And so this is going to automatically train a model. Uh, and we are going to set the refresh schedule again. Um, so this is just telling uh, Abacus that I want to retrain this model because uh, I'm importing new data every single day. Let's uh, train a new model on that new data uh, every day at 12.15 UTC. So it just gives us a little time uh, between when we started the import job and uh, when we're actually going to start training the model. Uh, and so once we hit play here, uh, this will now create the model. So we see that is now pending. So it's uh, going to start training shortly. Uh, and we will then have a, a model that's going to automatically uh, retrain every single day. Um, and so this next box will sit and wait uh, until the model is done training. Uh, as we, uh, as this is a very large data set, uh, this usually takes around 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so we're not going to be able to see it to the end at, uh, for this workshop. Um, however, uh, I did provide you with a uh, utility checkpoint here. Uh, so these machines do time out after about uh, 30 minutes of inactivity. Uh, so what you can do is uh, just navigate straight down to the checkpoint box here, uh, insert, reinsert your API key. Uh, and when you hit play, it will automatically uh, find the project inside of your organization. Uh, it will find the model that we started training and then it'll again start waiting uh, for that model to finish training. Um, and so it's a, a quick utility for being able to, to restart where you're at um, and, and then get to the and finish this workbook. Um, so I already, uh, as, as Matt had shown, uh, trained a model beforehand. Uh, so we're, uh, if you want to just pop back over to the uh, Zoom meeting, I'm going to then walk through here uh, and I'll show you how to schedule a batch prediction uh, to be uh, created every, every day. Um, after after the the training is done, um, so I'm going to hit play, and that will automatically pick up the project I had trained earlier. Um, actually, it's going to get the project I had just created, so I do apologize. So let me go ahead and grab the correct project here. Um, so let me grab the project ID that. I trained up here. So let's see, we have the project ID. And so going back down here, let me go ahead and stop the execution. And so I'm going to just replace this box here where it's just going to iterate through my projects and find a specific one based on the name. Instead, I'm going to call clients dot get projects. And if I had copied the ID and paste that in there, let's try that again. Let me grab the project ID, scroll back down. All right, so now when I hit play, make sure I'm using the correct API and describe projects and let me grab the correct uh, sales forecasting project ID here. All right. There we go. All right, so finally, now I have my uh, 
correct project and I should see, yes. Okay, so now I have my trained model. So it's gone through and found the model that is currently trained. Um, so now I'm able to then get the metrics. Uh, so when we're uh, training a model, uh, we have plenty of options, just like you saw in the UI for being able to have different uh, parameters when you're training. Uh, you can have different forecast lengths. So right now the defaults for this data set is to predict uh, four weeks into the future. Um, we can change that to uh, pretty much any value. So we can predict 10 weeks into the future. Obviously as, as time goes on, uh, the predictions are less and less confident uh, as, as we're predicting further out, but uh, we're able to then, or we, we are able to do it. Um, we, uh, but uh, so that way we, we do want to make sure that our models that we're training are accurate. And so we can, the way that we compare models is by looking at the metrics. Uh, and so we have uh, for forecasting, we specifically have four different uh, metrics that we want to compare against. And so I'm going to print these out here. Um, but essentially we have a bias, uh, coefficient of variation, uh, normalized root mean square error, and as well as uh, symmetric mean absolute percent error. And I provided a little descriptions for each here. Um, essentially, the uh, normalized root mean square, uh, square error, uh, or NRMSC, um, it's used for forecasting uh, to measure the forecasting error and uh, calculate the differences between each of the predicted values uh, versus what the observed value. So when we train this model, uh, we split off the end of each of these time series, and then we then basically said, okay, now that we have these actual values that we uh, that we know happen, let's actually start a few time steps back and try to predict uh, what the future is going to be, uh, pretending we don't know what those values are, and then we compare it with the actual values uh, that that we know do exist. So, uh, a lower NRS MSE the better. Uh, so we want to get as close to zero as possible. And again, with symmetric mean absolute percent error. Um, it's the, the calculated average between uh, the, the difference in observed results. Um, so it's a little bit different way of looking uh, at the, the, the average error. Um, and then the coefficient of variation, uh, it's uh, measuring the forecastability of the time series data set. And uh, again, we're, we're trying to get as close to zero as possible. Um, and then finally, the bias, it's uh, it, against the collection of data points. Um, it's comparing it uh, in respect to the sample mean. Um, it's used to determine how many, uh, or how the sample mean deviates from true underlying uh, parameter for the mean. Um, so looking at this, this is actually doing really well for predicting the future. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and deploy this model. And so deploying essentially will spin up cloud resources, which allows us to make real time predictions against this model, as well as uh, creating batch predictions. So I'm going to hit play here. And so this will create a new deployment with the name sales forecasting. And so uh, this will take a minute or two to create this deployment. And uh, again, every, everyone here will be able to do this uh, as soon as your model is done training. Uh, it should take uh, just a little bit after the, the workshop, you should be able to deploy your model. You can also go direct or do everything you're seeing here in the UI. Um, but I do want to get you guys to the point where you can see how to, to automatically schedule these batch predictions and then being able to fetch them uh, automatically. So we'll, we'll wait for this to spin up. Um, but the, the, after we're done creating the deployments, uh, we're going to create a de deployment token. So this is a little bit different from your API key, where your API key allows you to manage all of your resources, all your projects, uh, create new, new jobs uh, inside of your, your projects. Uh, the deployment token only does real-time predictions. So this allows you to uh, hit the uh, prediction endpoint uh, with a different authentication scheme. This allows you to embed it inside of a public website or inside of an application uh, without having to worry about having uh, the security implications of being able to create projects inside of your organization. Uh, so this deployment token is specifically used only for this project. Uh, and so you can safely use this and, and use different uh, projects with the different security. Um, so just to show you uh, that it's completely separate, uh, here's our API clients. Uh, we're reinstantiating it without an API key. Uh, so it has no authentication um, except for the deployment token. So this is uh, a, a model that I had deployed earlier. Uh, so we're going to provide it, or we're going to call the get forecast API. 
we're going to give it our deployment token, as well as the deployment ID I want to predict against. And then we're going to give it query data. And so this inside of this uh, uh, object, essentially, we're going to have our ID column, which is store department, uh, as well as give it the actual identifier for that store department. And so this will then predict on that store department uh, the next four time steps and uh, also give it the uh, percent quantiles. Uh, we have P10, P50, P90, just like we uh, created when we trained the model, um, or these were the defaults in, inside of the UI. Um, and so it, for each of the time steps in the future, so now we have four time steps in the future, starting from uh, 2012, 11.02, and then each week, uh, we have a new weekly sales prediction uh, for each of these quantiles. So this is kind of like the low bar uh, average and then the high bar of the prediction. Um, so now that our deployment, is, or now that uh, this deployment is active, I can again do the same kind of prediction here um, using my uh, newly created deployments as well as my de deployment token. Uh, we can of course change the store department. If we look inside of the data set, we can find different stores and departments to see each department's uh, sales. Uh, and so we also provide a uh, quick utility inside of the uh, UI, which allows you to copy and paste just this code, uh, which allows you to quickly reference and embed this uh, wherever you need or wherever you might need it. Um, but uh, before I jump over to the UI, just to show you that, uh, I want to just show you again how you can automatically create batch prediction jobs. Uh, again, we're just going to use that same refresh schedule concept uh, where we have uh, the, the specific uh, minute, hour, uh, and any day, any month, any year. Uh, we're going to create a new batch prediction using this deployment. And so when I hit play here, this is going to create a new batch predict job uh, and we'll create a a new CSV. And so basically what it's doing is just taking the latest data sets, uh, finding all of the IDs and all the time series for each of these, uh, uh, each of these uh, store and departments, and it's going to create a prediction for each of them. Um, so we have a few thousand stores. So it's uh, rather than sitting here and for every single store, changing the store departments, changing a number uh, and hitting play each time and getting the results, it's doing this all in one call. Uh, and so that allows us to then now schedule all the way through from retrieving new data, uh, training a new model, and then for each, every new model that we create, we're going to create a new batch prediction on a schedule. And so we all we have to do now um, as, as Walmart is to uh, just dump our data directly to the bucket where we uh, started the, the data sets. And every day we're going to get fresh, fresh uh, weekly prediction or fresh predictions um, for each of our store sales. And so we're then able to make good forecasts uh, uh, for stock and for uh, uh, our, our sales and, and revenue forecasting. And so once this is done, uh, this takes roughly eight minutes uh, to get through all 3,000 stores. Um, but once we're done, we'll be able to read the CSV. So I'm going to go ahead and hop back over to the UI and show you a little bit of this. Um, so let me change my tab again here in Zoom. Sorry, it's still, let's see here. There we go, it was hiding. Share my screen again, go back to Chrome. Okay. All right. So now I'm back inside of my project uh, with my pre-trained model. Uh, so we have, if I hit refresh here, we should see our new deployments that we created. Yes. So we got the, the latest deployments I uh, created today. And so if I go ahead and click on this deployment, um, we can see the predictions API. Uh, so you can see my refresh schedule. You'll see uh, that uh, batch predictions will next run on July 24th, 2020 at uh, 1 p.m. And so if I go to my predictions API, uh, it will show me the, the exact code for how to, to make a sample prediction here. So this is exactly what you'd saw in your uh, in the notebook. Uh, we can also change the language. We can, uh, for example, do curl. Uh, this will just show us 
how to how to interface with this API using our deployment token, deployment ID, and the query data. And so you can again easily embed this um, for these live predictions and even make an, an example call, which would then again exactly what we saw in the notebook. Uh, but you can also uh, play around with it a little bit more uh, and explore uh, inside of our or inside of the our, our UI. Um, so what this does is essentially allows us to select our store and department. And it will automatically plot the uh, next few steps um, in terms of the predictions. So again, we have the quantiles of P90, P50, and P10. Um, and so if we, for example, were to select one of these, uh, select one at random, this looks all right. Uh, so let's go ahead and move it back a couple weeks. We can then compare to, to how it's uh, our prediction versus the the actual. So this is essentially just taking uh, time, uh, a few time steps back, uh, make, cutting off our actual data and knowledge, and then predicting the, the next few future steps. Um, so we can do this for any of the stores. We can also turn on and off different quantiles uh, to, to view them in, in the UI. Um, and then finally, we have the batch predictions dashboard. Uh, so we can see that there have been uh, two batch predictions created. Um, we can copy a download link or download the, the results directly. Um, and it, by the looks of it, uh, already did create, uh, this one might have been from earlier. Um, anyways, uh, so we can also create batch predictions directly here. Um, so if we hit create new predictions. I think it was on the different deployment. Yeah, so okay, the our one that we just created is still going. It's only five minutes old. Um, so yeah, on, on this old one, uh, so we can go ahead and create new predictions. This will allow us to specify the batch prediction name. Uh, we can also uh, export the results back to S3. Uh, so if we uh, have uh, given uh, Abacus AI uh, access to our S3, write access to our S3 bucket. We can actually write the results directly back to our bucket, and so we can have uh, the the results directly available inside of the the cloud infrastructure. Um, and then again, we have the refresh schedule expression. So if we wanted to do this on a cadence, uh, we can uh, set that up directly here in the UI. Um, and then once this is done, uh, we can then see the results. The results are just going to be a CSV uh, essentially of the same format as our prediction where for each uh, for each of these stores, we're going to have uh, three columns, P10, P50, and P90, and the date as well as the weekly sales. Um, so that should get us through everything. I apologize. Uh, moving quickly, uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions here at the end as well as uh, if Ankit has, has a little bit of time or Time to get back to the council here, and you can show off some of the explanations uh, that yep. he was going to show off. Yep, thank you, Austin. That was awesome. Let me take up some of the explanation stuff. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, so I already trained a life expectancy regression model using our predictive modeling use case. This data set is openly available on Kaggle under one of their contests. So you can go ahead and check it out. So these are some of the data set details, 2.5K rows, 22 columns. So based upon uh, a lot of demographics information, social and econ economic and immunization uh, factors of people in that country, the, the output of uh, life expectancy corresponding to all these features from that country, we can evaluate using this uh, use case, using a model under trainer to this use case. So you're all aware about the, the UI, the console itself, and even the APIs now, as Austin has already showed it. Thanks to Matt for showing the UI as well. So I'll just quickly jump to the prediction dashboard. I've already created a model. As you can see, the metrics are here. I've deployed it. And if I go to the deployment dashboard, it will pick up the first value. And then these are the expl ex explanations that uh, I was talking about earlier during my presentation. 
So let's have a look at it. You can also experiment with uh, the test case data here. Like for example, let's select this one. So life expectancy is predicted to be 73.65, where the actual is 72.8, which is quite good, considering the amount of data that we have, especially. So if you closely look at all these features, so this adds on by this factor, income composition of resources. So consider this as like uh, the, the income, the whole income of the family. So this adds on to the life expectancy, which, which intuitively makes sense, right? And then here, country, uh, let's see which country it is. It's Mauritius, it's developing. So somehow this is a developing country though, but still it, is, uh, it has a fairly good mortality rate. So the country factor is also corresponding a little uh, here. I mean, it's the second most important feature. And then these are the negative features, infant death, hepatitis B, uh, column thinness five to nine years. So here, one interesting thing to note down is uh, it's not necessary that all these factors will positively or negatively influence all the time. Like, let's say polio. Polio, from the wording, you might feel like, oh, it's a, it's a negative factor to decrease the life expectancy, right? But look at the value. As I said in the beginning of the talk, that the value of the input feature, right? That depends, uh, that is taken into consideration while making an explanation for that particular instance. It's like a local reference that is made by the, for these, for cat calculating Shapley values or line values or whatever it is. Uh, so that's why if there's less polio value, then it will positively contribute. But if it's high, there's a lot of polio in that country, then it will negatively contribute. So let's illustrate it this, uh, the same thing a little more by taking some other example where the expectancy is low. Okay, so this seems to be quite low. Okay, so if you see now, so there are plenty of factors that are contributing negatively, right? Like adult mortality, HIV, infant death, so you got the idea, right? Like how the value determines and contribute, how one single individual value determines the final regressed life expectancy and how all these top factors are contributing to those final outcomes. And suppose you didn't have this, then your model might be overfitting, right? And you would never know whether it's overfitting. But with this, you would be able to fairly see how much your model is making sense in what scenario. And if it makes sense, then probably your model is actually a good generalization of the new incoming data streams that you've got. So I guess uh, that's all for these Shapley values and our a API prediction that you can use for generating these uh, uh, values. Besides, I would like to quickly show one more thing here. So you're familiar with all this. Uh, this is the documentation that we were referring to in regards to answering a few of the questions that were imposed in the Q&A text. And this is another cool thing, model showcase, that we have recently, uh, uh, recently introduced. So here, what you can do is, you can train the model on our platform and then go to, and then publish those models and share with our community. So once you share with the community, it looks like this, let me, used Matt's model. Okay, so this is training. Okay, somehow it's not showing in this organization to share with the community. You need to click on the actual model, there you go. So here, when you click on the model, you can share that specific model with uh, the community. And when you click on it, you will be asked to like uh, enter the details like a description, a cool name for your model, and then you would be live with your model on this community page. And there's some interesting stuff there uh, towards analyzing the accuracy metrics of these models, like you can see here, the NDCG and the map values. So you all are more familiar with forecasting, so I might, and regression, so I might uh, wanna open one of those. So this is the model that I showed you. And these are the 
uh, the, this is another result of the feature importances, like top features, income composition, status, polio year. So these are the top contributing factors for, for, the, for the overall uh, prediction. So this is not the individual reference. This is the whole global reference where the whole data set, all the data points within the data set are evaluated and then the top features are calculated. So this is our auto ML part. And this is the val loss curve. So there's a lot of cool stuff for you guys to analyze and read upon. I would encourage you to put your models, train them and then uh, showcase to our community here. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. This is a forecasting one, real time forecasting. It will have all those familiar metrics that Austin was talking about, SMAPE, so for all these entities in the, uh, like the meter 141, 289, you have values with respect to time, actual versus predicted and predicted. And as you can see, it's like kind of very close, right? Yep, so seems to be working really well. So I would like to just conclude here by saying that uh, you're all very welcome to try out our service and also if you have any questions, you're also, you're most welcome to contact us to get in touch, or, touch with me or any of our ML experts or our research team. And we would be very happy to, to have you and answer your questions. Thanks a lot for attending this workshop and I hope you would have a great time ahead. Thank you so much. Great, thanks a lot for the uh, workshop presentations. Uh, by the way, I just double check. Uh, have you like go through all of the questions in the Q and A? Yeah, I think most of the questions are answered. If anybody has anything left unanswered, then we can definitely take upon that. Yeah, it okay. looks like uh, we've got a question on pricing. Um, so the the pricing is actually extremely competitive, um, but you can check us out uh, on the pricing page. Um, actually, I, I don't think that it's live on the free trial application. So every, everything right now is, is free for you. Um, so feel free to train away, uh, try us out, upload data. Like uh, it's free to upload data sets. You're charged um, per training hour once you have uh, gone to production. Uh, essentially, the only limitation with the free trial is that your deployments will automatically spin down after 24 hours. You can spin them back up as much as you want. Um, but we, we don't have any current capture limits. Um, so yeah, definitely turn away experiments. We're, we're excited to see what you're built, uh, what you're willing to build or what you're able to build. Um, and so yeah, the, the price at the end of the day is uh, based on your training time as well as the uh, your deployment size. So depending on the number of predictions you're getting per second, uh, we're going to portion more machines uh, to, to help serve uh, these models and, and serve the predictions super fast. And so uh, that's basically our, our pricing model. Um, uh, so you probably want to post the link for the pricings because when I was say the page does not exist, I'm not sure if he entered the correct uh, UI or not, but uh, if you can post the, uh, the link, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out the link for that. Okay. Um, and uh, we have one attendee raise a hand. I will allow him, uh, her, him or her to talk. Uh, so she prob uh, they probably have some questions. Uh, hey, St uh, is Stephanie or Steph? Uh, you... uh, St Stephen. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, sorry. All right, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sorry, just a one line question I'd asked Anka uh, earlier that didn't get answered. What was the model type you used for um, life expectancy? Is it GBRT, logistic regression, neural? It's a deep neural network uh, that is powered by auto, auto ML. So hyperparameter optimization, as well as data augmentation is done using auto ML capabilities. But it's basically a deep learning, a deeply neural network uh, model, uh, regression model. And uh, we are actually a deep learning first company, so we try to use the capabilities of deep learning as far as possible. No, no, I understand. But in, um, if uh, the goal of, of the, the exercise there was to, to show explainability, uh, I've generally read it said that if you use logistic regression or, or tree, uh, you're, you know, you're sacrificing some asymptotic accuracy, but you're buying yourself more explainability. Is that true in your experience? Can you comment on that? If, 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 it, if the main intent is for explainability, not a production model, that also has decent explainability. But if, if raw explainability is your, your you know, main intent, what would you do? 
So, um, like feature I, exploration. So as I already mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, for simple models like a linear regression, logistic regression, the features are readily interpretable owing to the nature of, the, of those simple models, right? So well, not, 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 not if they're interaction terms, because if you compare infant mortality, it, if, the, if the life expectancy in a country is 50 versus 80, by definition, the infant mortality for under fives will be higher in the first country. So you have to normalize it. So there's, feature, there's all sorts of feature interactions. So are you saying that the, the, if the features are normalized, then it will be a problem to, to like uh, calculate? Oh, I'm saying if the features aren't normalized, it's obviously a problem. But even if the features are normalized, there are still interactions. And a model that can't sort of handle arbitrary n-dimensional interactions, then that's also a problem for, and, and give decent explainability. OK, so there's a thing. Uh, the normalization doesn't break anything because it's just tampering with it's it's not it's just tampering with the scale right and everything else is intact so you can easily find those weights if the model is not as complicated as a deep neural network or an ensemble model and as far as uh, your regularization of uh, or other fancy technique is concerned that might reduce those weights then also you might come up with some not so sophisticated uh, ways in order to in, to, in order to in, interpret like just like just tweak those weights and see the fluctuations in the output. And that way you would be able to know a lot about the importance of those weights uh, for that particular output. So it's not that hard, but in case of deep learning, it's a highly nonlinear complicated model. And there's where the explainability plays a very crucial and huge part. For that you ex explicitly need to train another model, which might be linear or nonlinear, depending upon the method that you're using to train it. And that will be able to tell you something about your black box, but not entirely. Uh, any any model trained by any method at this point of time cannot entirely tell you about the black box, but yeah, it can make an attempt as I uh, as, as I've shown with the example of the model trained under the regression use case. Sure thing, thanks. And if if you if you work to ensemble, say three different models, say whatever logistic regression, neural tree, and deep neural net, is that like a nightmare for explainability? Is it possible to actually get decent explainability from an ensemble? Yeah, I imagine it's a problem. So. Decent, so that's the thing, like it's very context dependent. Like in the loan case that I illustrated, uh, that I included in my slides, in that loan case, the guy was actually getting a decent explanation of why his loan request was being rejected, right? So mm -hmm. you can call it decent in that context, right? But in some contexts, like a lot of self-driving car situations, it, it like you might have those, uh, have you seen those uh, heat maps that are generated that kind of tells you that where the, where's what direction the car wants to go? So mm -hmm. those heat maps are useful, but in a complex situation, they might actually be very, uh, they're like limited in the, the amount they could help for determining mm -hmm. the direction of some other. It's a multi, it's a like multi activity uh, uh, kind of a deep neural network that is handling like, let's say 149 different sorts of activities that are happening in the self-driving mode. So in that case, it might really become very infeasible to incorporate any kind of explainability method that is present in this uh, uh, world right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. sure. So it depends highly on the context and the problem statement. It's, uh, it's very hard for me to generally say anything. Even if you make it concrete that, okay, you are using some boosting technique or uh, you're, you're using some ensemble again, then the question will be which ensemble, what are, what are the different machine learning techniques you have used for ensembling? Are you ensembling a decision-based tree with uh, some neural network or some SVM classifier uh, with decision uh, or random forest or whatever? So it all depends on like what kind of ensemble, how complicated it is, how well are you training the, uh, your explainability model, right? Because you're the amount of, so, when the data increases, then also the number of samples sometimes uh, increases. And sometimes the data itself is not conduis conducive to producing the explanations right. So it also depends on the data, you know, the, the probability distribution under in the, the underlying patterns in the data and the probability distributions on how well they, those explanations would, uh, would work for you. So it, it's, yeah, I think that's how I would answer this question. Okay, uh, we have another uh, questions. Uh, is the cameras, uh, you are um, unmuted, you can speak. Sorry, I don't know how to say your name. Yeah, it's, a, it's a KK. Hi, 
Um, thank you, Ankit. Uh, it's a nice uh, talk. I came specifically to hear about the explainability kind of thing. Like uh, that's where uh, I was stuck in a couple of uh, projects. Uh, where, uh, what's your take on doing a multi-label classification on a text analytics? Uh, is that something which uh, Abacus AI can handle that type of uh, situations? We have future plans to enter into computer vision and natural language processing. So we would incorporate all those things as well. But for now, we are basically uh, concerned with uh, all the use cases that you could find on our UI, on our console, like forecasting, recommendation, regression, and classification things. Uh, yeah. So uh, with image data and uh, other mod unstructured modalities like text, you're not particularly addressing them right now as of now. So yeah, so with our platform, it won't be so feasible. But, but in general, as I in included in my slides, you can play with unstructured modalities by, by doing those uh, uh, binary vectors kind of things, right? Like you train a vector on the basis of your context and use case, and then you utilize those uh, feature vectors in order to uh, get some kind of explanation out of your unstructured. Like, like I showed the, the, the thing, right? The wolf confused with uh, the dog, right? Uh, so in that case, you were actually utilizing those uh, heat maps in order to detect that. It's the snow that is actually um, affecting the model's results rather than the dog or the wolf himself. So yeah, you can do that. I mean, multi-classification, multi multi-label classification is not a big deal if you can achieve and, and um, the results with that sort of complexity. Yeah. I mean, multiply, as compared to the complexity that arises in that context, multi-label multi classification will be a sort of easier when it comes okay. to explain. Okay. Yeah. And um, in, in terms of that, uh, di the, the- But I guess, yeah, uh, remember- screens Sorry. It depends. It, it depends on the data set. Like you might have a complicated data set that might not be so feasible when it comes to using all these explainability methods. So it okay. depends some, some, yeah, to, to a good extent on the kind of data that you have. Yeah. Yep. Okay. In, in, in your, in your screens that you showed to us, uh, there were a few of the labels which you were showing as the top 10 or top five labels which were actually helping you to uh, find the regression output basically. So can I safely assume like those were the top 10 uh, features, weights of the features? Correct, for that particular instance, yes. Yeah, if okay, all right. Instance, then it will change. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Okay, uh, we have probably one more last questions. Uh, it's in the Q&A sessions. Do you want to open up to take a look? Oh, where, where is it? I can't seem to find. Can you read the question? Okay, uh, it's from John. Uh, the example had one relation between store department and weekly sales. Is there any limit to the relational complexity? Could you have item by store, color by item, uh, color by item by store, uh, etc.? Okay, so the example had one relation. I think I found between store department and weekly sale. Is there any limit to the relational complexity? Could you have items by store, color by items? Yes, yes. It's up to you. Like you can tweak the data set and upload it as 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 you would like. I mean, we don't restrict 